Hello, my name is Thiago Torrente, and I'll be presenting in this video our paper Domain Adaptation in Neural Machine Translation using a qualia enriched FrameNet. I'm presenting this paper on behalf of my co authors at the FrameNet Brazil Lab at the Federal University of Juiz de Fora, Alexandre Costa, Matheus Marin, and Eli Matos. So, in summary, what this paper aims to present are two implementations of a methodology for domain adaptation in neural machine translation systems using a qualia enriched frame net as a semantically structured external resource. The problem then is framed as a problem of domain adaptation, which can be exemplified by those two sentences in Brazilian Portuguese with their correspondence translations in English. So in the first sentence, we have o jogador de basquete converteu a bandeja, while in the second sentence, we have o garçom colocou as tigelas na bandeja. Note that in the first sentence, the lexical item bandeja is translated as layup, as in the basketball player scored the layup. While in the second sentence, the same lexical item, bandeja again in Portuguese, is translated as tray, in the waiter put the balls in the tray. So what we see here is that the different contexts in which bandeja, this polysemous word in Brazilian Portuguese occurs, defines their translation in English. In frame semantics terms, what we see is that this lemma bandeja in Portuguese evokes two different frames. So it gives rise to two different lexical units in frame map. So bandeja in the context of the sports evokes the winning moves frame where an athlete, competitor or a team makes a move that awards a point. On the other hand, in the sentence with the waiter, bandeja, which is translated by tray, evokes the utensils frame. When a utensil is a container, a tool, or something that is specially for household use. So the issue here, the question here is, how can we ensure that machine translation systems make the correct difference, may, maybe basing their decision on the context of the sentence, the context provided by the sentence? So there are uh, semantic structures in frame net that could be used for helping in this process. The first of which is a frame to frame relation. So frame to frame relations are present in every frame net. And basically they are what make a uh, frame net a net and not a list of frames. So for example, the winning moves uh, frame inherits the moves frame because it's more specific. It's a kind of sports move. Uh, the moves uh, frame is a subframe of the sports event frame. And it also uses, uh, meaning that it makes reference to other frames such as athletes, for example, or the sports. In FrameNet Brazil specifically, we implement another kind of relation which connects frame elements in a given frame to another frame. So for example, the athlete frame element in the winning moves frame can be linked to the following frames in frame. Map. So the athletes frame, which is evoked by lexical units such as athlete or competitor, the athletes by sport frame, which can be evoked by LU such as boxer and golfer, and the athletes by position frame, which can be evoked by lexical units such as center or wing, for example. Although frame to frame and frame element to frame relations are capable of capturing some sort of information that is present in the sentential context, which would in the end define the most suitable translation for bandeja, either as layup or tray in English, those relations are held between frames and not between lexical units. So in other words, the relation between winning moves and athletes, for example, is not able to represent that a layup is a kind of winning move that is performed by a basketball player and not by a soccer player or a tennis player, for example. So to address this issue, FrameNet Brazil developed ternary qualia relations, which bring together frame semantics implemented as FrameNet and the generative lexicon theory. Uh, 
In the original proposition of the generative lexicon theory by James Pustayovsky, four types of qualia roles were proposed. So the formal, the tillic, the constitutive, and the agentive qualia roles were proposed. So formal quail indicate that one item is a type of another. The tillic quail indicates that one item is made for something. The constitutive relation indicates that one item is made of another item, while the agentive relation indicates that one given item was brought into existence or created by an agent. So for example, if we take pizza and we apply those roles, those qualia roles uh, to this lexical item, we could say that food is a formal quail of pizza, that eat is a tillic of pizza, that flour is constitutive of pizza, and that either a cook or a pizza restaurant can be the agentive of pizza. So some initiatives such as the Brandeis ontology or simple ontology create subtypes of those qualias as of those qualia roles as an ad hoc or external resource or additional resource. But in FrameNet, since we already had frames, what we did was to mediate qualia relations using existing frames. So if we keep the pizza example, what we can propose in a ternary qualia relation is that the agentive relation connecting the pizza restaurant or the cook to pizza can be mediated by the cooking creation frame. And we can go one step forward and map the cook in this cooking creation frame to the pizza restaurant or to the cook lexical items and the produced food to pizza. The same kind of reasoning applies to the ingredients frame mediating the constitutive relation between pizza and flour, the exemplar frame mediating the formal relation between pizza and food, and the two purpose frame mediating the tillic relation between eat and pizza. In the case of the basketball player and the layup, the frame mediating the relation is the intentionally act frame and the basketball player would be framed as the agent in this frame, while the layup, the move, would be framed as the act performed by the basketball player. In total, FrameNet Brazil created around 9,000 instances of ternary quality relations applied to the domain of the sports for both Brazilian Portuguese and English. After this database, uh, this structured database was created for the sports domain, we developed SILA, a methodology for domain adaptation using frames and qualia. SILA is a two-step process. So first, it performs frame disambiguation in the sentences. So it assigns frames to the ambiguous lexical units in a sentence given the context. And then it performs terminology injection in the machine translated versions of those sentences, either during the pre-processing stage or in the post-editing stage. So there are two implementations of uh, this methodology. The frame disambiguation process is carried out by DAISY, an algorithm developed by FrameNet Brazil, uh, meaning that it's a disambiguation algorithm for inferring the semantics of why. So what DAISY does is first take in an input sentence, parse the sentence for dependencies using an external dependency parser. In this implementation, we have used the UD pipe uh, parser. Then multi-word expressions are retrieved from the FrameNet Brazil database just to make sure that they are considered as one whole lemma instead of a set of separate lemmas. Then, based on very simple dependence relations, lemma clusters are defined, and the LUs associated to each lemma are retrieved from the FrameNet Brazil database. So qualia relations holding between those lexical units are also retrieved, and all the possible frames evoked by each LU are also retrieved. And then frame element to frame relations are retrieved to compose the full network of semantic relations that can be inferred from a sentence. So, for example, if we return to our first sentence, o jogador de basquete converteu a bandeja, which is translated as the basketball player scored the layup, this is the graph output that DAISY generates. So we see that we have just uh, one cluster, 
because this is a basic subject verb object uh, sentence. So we see that jogador G and basquete are retrieved as a multi-word expression. And we see that bandeja here can be related to the artifact frame, to the winning moves frame, or to the utensils frame. And in the end, the winning moves frame gets the highest activation level because of the correlations that we found between this frame and athletes by sport, for example, in this scenario. It's important uh, to point out that DAISY uses spread activation on the network of frames and relations in FrameNet Brazil to calculate those activation values and scores and choose the best fit frame. If we look at the other example, o garçom colocou as tigelas na bandeja, the waiter put the balls on the tray, what we see is that bandeja now gets a higher activation level for the utensils frame. This is due to the fact that tigela also, or ball, also evoke the utensils frame. This co-activation favors the utensils interpretation. So after the sentence um, goes through frame disambiguation, we can uh, proceed to use the two possibilities of terminology injection. So in SILA S, meaning SILA in the source sentence, this is what the S stands for, the terminology injection is, do, is made during the pre-processing stage. So the flow is the following. So the user inputs a source language sentence that goes through frame disambiguation using DAISY. And then we search once the, the, the sentence is disambiguation, is disambiguated for the translation equivalence in frame that for those terms. And then we substitute the domain specific terms that are present in the FrameNet database in the source sentence. And we feed a neural machine translation API for this implementation. We are using this version two of the uh, Google Translate API. And we feed this API with a hybrid sentence. So all the specific terms are translated, and then the N NMT API receives a half Brazilian Portuguese, half English sentence, and translates that sentence into English. What happens here is that the API is configured to repeat the words that it doesn't recognize as part of the source language in the target language. And then what happens is that because the terms were translated into English, the system does not recognize them and then just repeats them in the output, okay? So for the Scylla T version, the terminology injection is made during the post-editing stage. It's a more uh, complex system. And what happens is that the source language sentence, in this case in Brazilian Portuguese, is uh, input by the user directly to the NMT API. And then we retrieve the NBAS translations generated by NMT API. And from those translations, we search FrameNet and bilingual dictionaries for translation equivalences. And we come up with a set of translation alternatives. Then using DAISY, both on the source language sentence and all the translation equivalences, we get frame disambiguated versions of those sentences. And then we can adjust the translation ranking generated by NMT API to favor those uh, translation alternatives where there is a match of the frames evoked in the source and target uh, sentences, or we can substitute an incorrect term by the correct translation or the more adequate translation in the domain of the sports and generate the target language translation. The reason why the implementation of uh, SILA-T is necessary is because when we do the hybrid sentence uh, as the input of the NMTC uh, API in SILA-S, we reduce the performance of the NMT system for all aspects related to 
morphosyntax, so inflections and adequacy of syntactic and morphologic relations. To evaluate the two implementations of SILA, uh, we do it, of course, in the sports domain, which is the, the, the focus of this uh, paper for the Brazilian Portuguese English language pair. So the data set we use is small. This is meant to be a proof of concept experiment. It's composed of 50 Brazilian Portuguese source sentences extracted from sports encyclopedias and new species and manuals featuring at least one polysemous lemma, meaning that at least one lemma in the sentence can be translated as either a word in the sports domain or outside of the sports domain, which is pretty much the case of bandeja as layup or tray, as we demonstrated in the examples. Then those 50 Brazilian Portuguese source sentences were translated into English by professional human translators, native speakers of English with a background in the sports domain. And then we assess the frame preservation in the source sentences and in the reference translations, and we got to a 72.4% of in-domain frame preservation, demonstrating that most, the majority of the sports domain frames were preserved in the human translations. For the experiments, we submitted the source sentences to a commercial NMT API which was taken as the baseline, in this case, the second version of Google Translate API, and to Sila S and Sila T. And then the machine translated sentences were evaluated for blow TR and HTR. And in the case of HTR, we used two professional translators for revising and altering the sentences, and then three other people for revising and scoring uh, the changes that were made by the human translators. So our results demonstrate that uh, Sila T has a very similar performance in Blow compared to the baseline. Uh, we are aware of the fact that Blow measures um, n-gram similarity, but to some extent, this can be seen as uh, an indicator that Sila T does not reduce the performance of the baseline system too much in what concerns morphosyntax. Uh, we can see that the TR results for the baseline and Sila T are very, very similar. Uh, we must remember that for TR, the lower the score, the better. And here, what we see is that Sila S um, has a poorer performance for TR because it ends up generating um, changes or variations in morphosyntax due to the hybridization of the input sentence. But the most important metric is, in this case is HTR, because what we see here is that Silat improves the baseline by, by almost 50% in HTR, meaning that the editing effort for the sentences translated using Silat is much lesser than the one um, for the sentences translated with the baseline. So as an example, if we take this uh, source sentence in Brazilian Portuguese, o ponto é o jogador que menos tempo tem para pensar na armação de uma jogada, the professional translators uh, produce the following gold standard translation in, in English. The winger is the player with less time to think about setting up a strike. So keep in mind here that ponta is translated as winger. This is a specific term of the domain. And if we look at the translation produced by the baseline system, ponta was translated as forward, which although is a term of the domain of the sports, is not the best translation for winger or for ponta in soccer, right? So we see that there is an HTR score of 0 0.08, which is relative to this change that had to be made by the professional translators. If we take uh, Sila S, we see an HTR of 0.6. And this is mainly due to the fact that the expression to think in the setup of a play sounded weird for the human translators. And if we compare this with Sila T, what we have is that Ponta is translated as winger, and then we have an HTR of zero, meaning that the Human translators found no need to change this sentence at all. Uh, 
So as for the conclusions and limitations of this work, we can conclude that Xylatine improves the performance of the baseline system by 47% in HDR when measured by professional human translators, that no fine tuning is needed for the model, which uh, represents much less uh, computational uh, effort for providing the better translations. But there are two very important limitations that we are aware of in this paper. First, the data set is very small and the experiments represent a proof of concept. And the baseline is a commercial system, so we uh, have no means of getting a lot of details of how this work, the system was trained and uh, what was the percentage of in-domain corpora used for training. Nonetheless, this is the first experiment to use a quality-enriched frame net for domain adaptation in machine translation. So we thank you so much for your attention and hope you enjoy your paper and meet us either online or during LREC. So bye-bye.